About two years ago, I was faced with a life-changing decision. About as life-changing as one can make at 14, of course. As a competitive swimmer, I was enduring a serious plateau in my times. For nearly a year and a half, I was frustrated and discouraged. A sport I had once loved and made me the most happy had become a constant source of fear and anxiety for me. Around this time, though, Little Livy was offered with an opportunity to transition teams, an idea I had avoided persistently as leaving my team, friends, coaches, and current training style was a change I did not want to welcome and symbolized me giving in to the fact that I needed help. The inner dialogue went a little like this. Livy, Livy, this is something new. This new team sounds really, really cool. It does. It could help you get faster, yeah? But you're not that great at talking in front of people. Do you really want to have to make all new friends? That's true. I know they say from rock bottom, all you can go is up. But I think with a shovel, you can always go a little deeper. And finally, maybe swimming just isn't your thing. Have you tried bowling? <laughs> no, and I don't intend to. Although my situation was rough and my frustration had been building, this inner dialogue pushed me into a state of stagnancy. Each practice I went to, I toggled with the idea, but couldn't quite get myself that I had to make a decision, and soon. It was as if I had two adversaries living inside of me, both claiming they wanted what's best, but never, never, never could come to a productive solution or conclusion. I sat on this metaphorical fence for about a year, until finally, in the spring of 2021, when I packed up my bags in Clear Lake and headed for downtown. With a little wobble in my walk, an apprehensive smile, and a fabulous driver named Mom, I made my new home at the team I'm at now. With this decision, although fearful, I found myself, as cringy as it is, in all meanings of the insta-worthy phrase. In the pool, in life, and in my friends. Now not only am I faster, but also happier, and constantly growing in the pursuit of progress. This monumental decision for me highlights a phenomenon we all too commonly see in our everyday society, indecision. After much deliberation, we decide that the risks outweigh the strengths, at least for the moment, and actively allow opportunities to slip away. I spent nearly a year in a negative situation for no other reason than the fear of what? I don't know. It's as if we hold many keys to many doors, but we're afraid of what the room might hold so we continue walking down the hallway of life. Today, I want to address why indecision is so debilitating, the neurological consequences, and how we can become even a little bit less indecisive to reduce stagnancy and reap the most from life. For reference, or, sorry. when I first started studying this occurrence, a common theme I noticed in even my most indecisive moments, whether that be to or to not move teams, what to wear to school the next day, or what to eat for breakfast, or whether or not to eat the oatmeal chocolate chip cookie sitting on the counter. To get things straight, you always eat the cookie, okay, okay? There was this internal deliberation, as if I had two people living inside of me that helped me make my decisions, each holding their own case. With this in mind, I decided to create a detailed scientific diagram to help articulate my ideas, the, neuro the neuroscience of indecision, and how my inner dialogues tend to go. For reference, decision-making takes place in the frontal lobe or the furthermost part of the brain. Though this part of the brain is typically stable in its response to stimulus, it can be easily influenced by emotions that are evoked in challenging or threatening situations. These emotions are typically a byproduct of new things. Knowing this, the first character I would like to introduce to you that resides in our frontal lobe is the pro-future and spontaneous character. Many of us are familiar with this person, or were familiar with this person at one point in their lives. For me, the childlike version of ourselves, for me, this is Little Livy. Little Livy is naive. She's carefree, she has no perspective of societal standards, has no memory of the past, is entirely future-oriented, and only makes decisions based off the pros. Little Livy is always looking for the next big thing, sees everything new as a challenge, a catalyst for growth, and truly believes that authentic action is the way to success. Little Livy is spontaneous, and is responsible for the action taking in our dialogue in our frontal lobe. On the other hand, the other adversary that lives in our brain, I like to call Olivia. Olivia is cautious. She likes to have everything planned out, looking for any unforeseen negatives in a situation. Olivia makes decisions only based off the past, looking for the most self-preserving and comfortable option. She views her job as to keep us safe, out of harm, 
and away from anything that could potentially evoke embarrassment or potentially from falling on stage. We're not going to do that today. <sighs> Little Livy, or Olivia sees everything new as a challenge to our current way of life and change as something to be avoided at all costs. Each character is associated with a button that, when pressed, signifies a decision being made. When one chooses to press Little Livy's button, it says, yes. When one presses this button, they follow through with action. The brain hears this button and internalizes it. On the other hand, when one chooses to press Olivia's button, it says, uh, Olivia never wants to flat out say no, but apprehensively wants to re-guide you towards inaction or indecision. When one decides that Olivia's perspective holds more value, they press this button. Again, the brain internalizes this. When one decides that both, when, when one makes a decision, whether big or small, they interpret each argument, process, and press a button. Our brain hears the button we pressed and makes changes in response. This is where neuroplasticity, brain behavioral patterns, and feedback loops come into play. Neuroplasticity is the ability for the brain to process, interpret, regulate, and maintain neurological pathways or synapses that allow for the transfer and interpretation of information. Synapses act kind of as a road for information to travel from one point to another. When one makes a decision or presses a button, their brain begins to associate an action with a specific stimulus or an occurrence and a feeling we experience after making that choice. This is the basis for feedback loops. To help articulate this, going back to the cookie idea, if we see a delicious oatmeal chocolate chip cookie sitting on the counter, we process each argument and, of, cho and of course, choose to eat the cookie. Our brain then begins to associate a cookie sitting on the counter with eating the cookie and the dopamine we experience from the sugar that it holds. Each time we repeat an action, our brain creates increased synapse connections that, enforce, that, that greater enforce the ability for us to make the same action in the future. This is the basis of habits. We see a cue, make a choice, and experience the rewards of that choice. Similar to how each time we eat a cookie, it becomes easier to eat the forecoming one. Each time we don't, don't make a decision, it becomes easier to not make the next one. When we begin to value the prospect of comfort and maintaining our current life situation over what we could become with action, our brain internalizes this and creates synapse formations that promote indecision. It also begins to associate the dopamine we experience from being comfortable and the cortisol that is also associated with that with avoiding new things. This opposes a serious issue, as when our brain becomes hardwired to avoid new things, we not only begin to act in accordance with that, but also leave us in a persistent state of stagnancy. This stagnancy limits our potential for success in life, as well as for its satisfaction that is all dependent on change. In other words, indecision deprives one's ability to reap the most from the unpredictabilities of life. Additionally, as synapses serve as the basis for personality development in our frontal lobe, each time we make a decision, we become more aligned with the per type of person that makes that choice. We become the person that eats the cookie, the person that makes the hard choices, or the person that applies to the hard programs, or vice versa. We become the person that avoids challenging obstacles, or the person that takes the easy way. We act in accordance with who we perceive ourselves to be. So if we perceive ourselves as less, we will act with less ambition. So you're probably thinking, yeah, Olivia, if I don't ever act, I'll never do anything different in life. After all, based off Einstein's definition of insanity, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. So yeah, we need to be less indecisive, but how? Well, I don't really know, but I came up with a couple strategies that could help us be even a little bit less indecisive to help reap the most from life and reduce stagnancy, enforcing progress. The first of these two strategies was created by Mel Robbins, and it's called the five-second rule. No, not that five-second rule. Instead, when a smaller decision comes about in life, you count to five. One, two, three, four, five, and act. No take backsies or rethinking, just act with instinct. This allows for less time to occur, less time to occur between little Livy and Olivia for deliberations, and enforces more intuitive decision-making that promotes that promotes feelings based off of future rather than fear. 
Now look at me. I know this will probably be difficult the first couple times. You'll want to rethink or reevaluate your choice. But just like how making an indecisive decision promotes the establishment of feedback loops that promote indecision, each time you make an intuitive decision, it establishes loops that promote efficiency and progress. The second, the second strategy I came about with that would help us with this issue is was created by renowned hostage negotiator Chris Voss. He uses speech patterns to help persuade people towards action. One of his techniques is by reframing a commitment in a no-oriented way. Let me demonstrate. When I was considering applying for this teaching, this speaking opportunity, I could have asked myself, should I apply in one of two ways? The first being yes-oriented. I could have asked, should I give a TED Talk? In order to follow through with this objective, I would have to say yes. Yes, I should do a TED Talk, but this is often met with opposition. Maybe I'm not ready. There's a lot of work that goes into this. It's really long. Maybe I'm just not capable yet. This poses an issue if I'm looking to follow through with this action. On the other hand, I could have asked, would it be so crazy if I were to do a TED Talk? Would it be so crazy? If I am looking to follow through with this objective, I would have to answer no. No, it wouldn't be so crazy. I've done long presentations before. I've done long presentations before with memory. I love learning to articulate my ideas and push through barriers that I otherwise might not have. This is a no-oriented question. As found by FBI Chris Voss's team in an MRI study, the response yes evokes a change in the frontal lobe part of the brain that it detects and interprets commitment. When one says yes, there is also this increased level in the hormone cortisol. This hormone is released by the amygdala, the part of the brain that is associated with emotional regulation, and the fight or flight response. This cortisol response also is associated with increased level anxiety and a decreased overall performance. On the other hand, <coughs> on the other hand, when one answers no to a question, they do not have this consequent increase in cortisol. They do not have this <laughs> degree, this response to stimulus. And overall, their performance is better. With this in mind, by simply changing should I to would it be so crazy if I were to, it allows for at least a brief momentary reevaluation of the task at hand. This leads to a better assessment of how grandiose a task might really be and allows for people to better interpret their skills versus demands in a more pragmatic, productive, and process-based approach. As stated by John Shedd, a ship in the harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are meant to do. Yes, in our current position, we are comfortable. We have everything we need, and we are guaranteed that nothing too disastrous will happen. Like a ship, we are guaranteed safety if we choose to be indecisive. We are promised stagnancy. But like a ship, we are meant to sail the open waters of our potential. We are meant to fall, fail, grow, and succeed. We are meant to have more, to be more, and to experience more. All that starts with one decision, though, I think. Haven't really decided yet. Thank you.